After the discovery of the quantization of energy by Max Planck in 1900, scientists began to question their previously established laws of the universe based on classical mechanics and began to look towards the atom in search of answers. Niels Bohr was a revolutionary in this branch of science, proposing in Manchester, England in 1913 that electrons orbit the atomic nucleus at quantized energy levels, absorbing and emitting energy in discrete amounts while shifting between energy levels in the process. This new theoretical idea was unconventional at the time and in need of experimental confirmation. It wouldn't take long before Bohr got his confirmation from two collaborating German physicists, James Frank and Gustav Hertz, who, ironically, had no idea of Bohr's proposed model until after they published their results. Both James Frank and Gustav Hertz were born in Hamburg, Germany in 1882 and 1887, respectively. To receive their doctorates, both men traveled around universities in Germany. Frank spent a year at the University of Heidelberg and then finished his doctorate at the University of Berlin in 1906. Hertz, following in the footsteps of his famous uncle Heinrich Hertz, bounced around from the University of Göttingen to the University of Munich and finally the University of Berlin, where he completed his doctorate in 1911. That same year, Frank was appointed a physics lecturer at the very same institution. Hertz followed suit in 1913 being appointed physics assistant at Berlin, and the two collaborated that same year. Having known about Planck's proposal, the two wanted to experimentally prove quantized energy emission and absorption, and so they set up an experiment to measure how current changes with increasing voltage in an electron chamber. The chamber they set up was rather small, no more than a few inches across. A cathode and an anode are placed in the chamber with an electric potential difference given between the two so that electrons could travel to the anode and a current can be measured. The only thing keeping this tube from being a vacuum chamber is a small droplet of mercury that has been vaporized due to the chamber being heated to 115 degrees Celsius. When electrons are fired from the cathode to the anode, they collide elastically with the mercury atoms perfectly bouncing off of them without transferring any energy. However, when a certain voltage threshold is reached, the electrons have enough energy to collide inelastically with the mercury atoms, transferring some of their energy to the atoms. This complicates the experiment because, although some electrons have lost energy due to collisions, all electrons would still reach the anode, and it becomes difficult to measure the energy loss through just the cathode and anode alone. So for this experiment, a wire mesh was placed in between the two electrodes and was given a positive voltage greater than that of the anode. That way, the electrons that did collide with the mercury atoms wouldn't have enough kinetic energy to reach the anode and would be collected by the wire mesh. Only electrons that didn't suffer a collision would have sufficient energy to fly past the wire mesh and reach the anode. From this setup, they plotted the anode current against the voltage applied to the wire mesh, and these were their results. What they found was that as voltage would increase, current would also increase, but at distinct increments of 4.9 volts, the current on the anode would drastically drop, and then after those increments were passed, the current would once again continue to increase. This led Frank and Hertz to conclude that the electrons were experiencing inelastic collisions with mercury atoms, transferring 4.9 electron volts of energy each time. Using a previously established quantum relationship between the energy of excitation and the corresponding wavelength of light, they were able to equate 4.9 electron volts to a wavelength of 254 nanometers. In their second paper regarding this experimental setup, Frank and Hertz released the wavelength of emission from their electron tube, which happened to be exactly 254 nanometers, confirming that mercury atoms were absorbing discrete amounts of energy from the electrons and releasing it in the form of photons with the exact same wavelength each time. Although Frank and Hertz didn't know about Bohr's proposed quantum model of the atom, their experiment verified the atom's quantum nature, and the three of them received international recognition for their efforts. Frank and Hertz continued their work on this experiment until the outbreak of the First World War later that year. 
Hertz was severely wounded in 1915, but both survived the war and returned to physics after it ended. In 1925, the two jointly shared the Nobel Prize in Physics for their discovery of the laws governing the impact of an electron upon the atom. The two had lucrative careers after their Nobel Prize. Frank ended up collaborating with Max Born and pressing the field of quantum physics forward, while also mentoring and collaborating with future physics pioneers such as Patrick Blackett and J. Robert Oppenheimer. Hertz became an administrator at a technical university in Berlin, in charge of rebuilding its physics department, and later in 1932, in his research, he developed a method for separating isotopes of neon. Both physicists made monumental contributions to the field of physics, and their breakthrough experiment in 1914 experimentally proved many quantum physics pioneers correct, helping drive a new and unpredictable path forward through the golden age of modern physics. If you enjoyed this video, please consider liking and subscribing. Click here if you want to see more scientific progress made during this time period. Thank you for watching, and I will see you in the next video.